Hello all, Rick here. With the conclusion of Star Trek Picard, the stage is set for a new age of exploration in the Star Trek galaxy. This video is sort of an overlook of the Federation and how it was portrayed in Star Trek Picard now that the series is done. An overview to chart how the values, choices and paranoia of Starfleet reflected the worlds of Star Trek, but to begin with that, we need to see the era that was left behind prior to the year 2399, season 1 of Picard. With the conclusion of Star Trek Nemesis in the year 2379, the Federation had been rebuilding after the ending of the Dominion War barely four years prior. The galactic scale battle had been the most costly war the Federation had seen since the early Klingon skirmishes of the 23rd century, and had led to the evolution of Starfleet designs to favour combat. Although this trend actually began after the encounters with the Borg years earlier, and the devastating Battle of Wolf 359, events like this forced Starfleet to start focusing more on battle-worthy ships, and things like the Akira, Sabre and Defiant were conceived in time for the eruption of the Dominion War. During the war, Starfleet was on edge, with every officer being pushed into combat drills and training. The exploration initiatives were maintained, but became pretty much a secondary concern, as those who would have been closer to scientists by trade became soldiers. Starfleet's tone changed to become darker, and I mean that literally. Ship hull designs were far dimmer, and the uniforms were adapted with the colourful shoulders being removed in favour of tougher and more resistant materials that obfuscated the division colours from a distance. Starfleet became more militaristic than ever before, with the morale declining as the war continued. On top of this, life within Federation worlds was hardly safe either. The Dominion had next to no civilians, but the UFP did. Almost every member world became a target by association and alliance, and no world was considered off limits by the Dominion. Even some of the Federation's oldest planets were threatened with even the likes of Beta Z being seized, and once the Breen entered the fray, Earth itself was assaulted for nothing more than the delivery of a point. Nowhere was safe. The populace would watch the battles unfold from afar, but every now and then the lines would encroach, a populace had to be evacuated, and everyday Federation citizens would look to the skies awaiting the appearance of a Dominion fleet, or the whine of Dominion transporter beams. And let's face it, they would have been almost as perturbed to see Starfleet at the time too, because if there was a huge Starfleet presence, then either they were expecting a Dominion attack, or enticing one. It was a paranoid time, so when it ended, there was a wave of relief, but one mixed with grief, trepidation, leaving those scars of war. On top of this, the Romulan ties to the Federation remained tense at best, and broke off as soon as the conflict was concluded, with the only real reaching out to the Federation being from Praetor Shinzon, which proved to be all a ploy. The following years saw Starfleet maintain those ships put into service, with even the poster vessel of the Federation being the Enterprise E, an exploratory ship for sure, but one designed for battle and with a far cry from the comfortable Galaxy class predecessor. Starfleet would, however, reach back into its core and bring forth those exploration, scientific, and diplomatic principles as soon as it was able. However, even these new ships were ones armed up. One bright spark of this time was the return of the USS Voyager from across the Delta Quadrant, bringing with it the spoils of exploration. Imagine this for a moment, that in the after years of the most brutal war, emerges a ship from the other side of known space one thought lost. Now, not only that miraculous feat, but it is a ship that completely evaded the Dominion War, and as merits go, it was one that had completed its journey and even prospered by sticking to the ideals of diplomacy, exploration and cooperation. 
it was a time capsule of Federation values bearing the fruits of that odyssey. For a time, this led Starfleet into a period of innovation and development. The quantum slipstream drive, the protostar drive, streamlined warp, new technologies, all of these were being pioneered and the Federation took to this with gusto. But all the while, it did not leave its phaser out of reach. It had been blindsided by the Borg, and the Dominion tested them like never before. That lingering paranoia was still there, and we saw it emerge in things like Section 31's black site of the Daystrom Station, and the genetic experimentation on changelings. Admirals like Les Buenamigo would develop completely automated vessels in an attempt to mitigate the risk to its crews, and both of these would have repercussions later down the lines, but for now were mostly kept behind closed doors. Then, the Federation caught wind of the culminating Romulan supernova, and Captain Jean-Luc Picard was selected to head a mass evacuation. Many within Starfleet wanted to help, but only to an extent. After all, the Star Empire had aided the Federation with the Dominion, but had since proven to be unreliable and still opportunistic. Romulan society as a whole demonised Starfleet and every other power as dangerous as a method of control over their own populace, and this level of propaganda is difficult to overcome. Many Romulans did not want Starfleet's help, but eventually they acquiesced. Picard was bolstered by the moral certainty of his actions and would travel throughout Romulan space, even breaking down the neutral zone which had stood for 225 years. Admirals like Clancy were left dealing with the ramifications of such actions, and Picard used his not inconsiderable sway to practically commandeer Utopia Planitia towards this relief effort. Wallenberg evacuation ships were created to be the single largest humanitarian fleet ever assembled over the next few years, until 2385. The Federation had enjoyed six years of innovation and design unhindered exploration, and a call back to its halcyon pre-war days. Things were starting to ease within the UFP, and then out of nowhere, on the Federation's doorstep, no, within its very home system, that humanitarian fleet was completely destroyed, and Mars rendered uninhabitable. With the synth attack, suddenly the Federation froze, and called back everything, arming itself for potential follow-up attacks. Their primary shipyard was gone, a massive loss of life, just when things were looking up and nobody knew what happened. No one claimed responsibility for the attack, and some speculated it was even the Dominion. Eventually, Starfleet settled on the notion that the synths somehow gained intelligence and rebelled, which should not have been possible as they were not sentient, but until they knew for certain, they shut down all such research. Suddenly. All that paranoia that had been brewing beneath the surface since the war no longer seemed so paranoid. Starfleet withdrew from the galaxy, though they still maintained exploration initiatives, but cautiously and with the majority of its fleet pulled back to defend their worlds. The UFP suddenly found itself within the same generation on guard again for an attack that this time never came. However, it did put an end to the Romulan evacuation efforts, and Admiral Picard threatened resignation in protest, following through on his threat. His stepping away was symbolic of the Federation losing those values and adopting a more cynical approach based entirely on self-preservation, and with even member worlds on the verge of leaving should the security of the UFP not be guaranteed first and foremost. The attitude was effectively not again. We clearly have our own problems, so screw everyone else. As selfish as that attitude may seem, it's understandable in the context of their recent history. For the next 14 years, Starfleet was not exactly idle, but preoccupied with its own eternal affairs and fears. The innovation that had begun post-war would continue, but once more the exploration initiatives were tentative as people were nursing the psychological scars from all too recently healed wounds. Most of this could be attributed to the lack of someone to blame. 
as harsh as that sounds. It was not until 2399 that Picard would unveil the radical internal sect of the Tau Shi'ar as being the culprits for the attack from misguided zealotry. But now Starfleet had created things like the Inquiry class, a very unfederation style <coughs> explorer vessel that was as much an explorer as the Defiant was and made them en masse. This was to be one of the last ships of the 24th century and not a high note for the Federation, but it captures their mindset. Sure, they wanted to continue to explore, but that optimism, that security that they once felt was gone. The future was harsh and the galaxy cruel, so they would have to be prepared to be just as callous. However, that mentality came to an end with the revelation of the Zatvash Tal Shi'ar. It did not change things that had happened, but the Federation took a look at itself and its path and reevaluated. Even Admiral Picard returned to the fold, almost symbolic of Starfleet finding its morality once again, although there were many within its ranks that never lost faith, at last others were just prepared to hear their voices once more. By 2401, Starfleet had renewed its commitment to its core beliefs, outside of defence. In this, it even looked back in its history and began to create ships such as the Sagan, Excelsior Mark II and Constitution Mark III. These ships were hearkening back to the eras of exploration from the late 23rd to early 24th century and for once, battle was not the focus of such craft. This redesign was to capture that spirit of optimism, literally nostalgia for the sake of reminding others what came before. After all, there were those now who had been born into this more standoffish Starfleet, those who had been taught the ideals of the Federation but then stepped into a guarded galaxy, and to them, this was the norm. Maybe a little old era flair was just what was needed to ignite the curiosity of the next generation. When Picard Series 3 wrapped up, yes, yet another attack on Earth had been weathered, but this was from within its own fleet, a problem created by exploiting the fleet formation technology. Now this tech was existent for one reason alone that I can see, battle lines and formation. What need is there for such technology in other fields, outside of very specific scenarios? With the future of Starfleet being preserved by the actions of the Old Guard, the Star Trek Picard ends on a surprisingly optimistically high note, and it's one reflective of the future of the UFP. Sure, there will be issues to address, but when isn't there? The difference is that now, the Federation has reignited that spark once more, finally emerging from that shell with a fresh desire to get out there and map the final frontier. Arming its vessels to the teeth is no longer at the forefront of their minds, and they're ready to tackle new challenges and see what new trials await. Thanks for watching this examination of how Starfleet has changed in the decades between Nemesis and Picard. There really are two pockets of time when Starfleet was more like its traditional self, between 2379 and 2385, and then post-2402. It's probably not a coincidence then that both Prodigy and Lower Decks take place in earlier periods before the synth attack on Mars and before everything went to the pits. In the intervening 85 to 99, well, this was a grimmer Trek setting, akin to the Dominion War, but more paranoid and with less blatant threats. Hi Finric, thanks again for watching, and I'll see you later for another lore video. Goodbye.